welcome to the second session of our SARM seminar season this year and continuing on into next year. And I have a few announcements before I introduce our speaker. Our next session in uh, early December, December the 7th, will be Professor Elaine Treharn talking on St. Nicholas and medieval pilgrimage. What could be more timely, especially the St. Nicholas Park, none of us can go on a pilgrimage. Um, on this January 11th, we have our always popular members night and we have four talks lined up by our own members for that evening. Um, so many of us remember him when he was getting his PhD at Stanford. And as he told some of us who were here earlier, he has just been able to step down as chair of the art and art history department at Cal State and gets to be on sabbatical this year. Can't travel anywhere, but can write all his books, right? And you may also remember he talks he's given us on the medieval monsters depicted in manuscripts and articles he's written for our newsletter, one on the Map of Monday at Hereford Cathedral and one on curating his dream exhibit at the Morgan Library in New York, where he got to go in the back room and play with all those fabulous, fabulous manuscripts. And that exhibit focused on uh, medieval monsters. His talk tonight is on global medieval maps. Asa, it's yours now. Okay, well, uh, thank you all so much. Uh, I'm gonna start my screen share here. There you go, you all see my uh, title slide, yes? Yeah, okay, I'm seeing nodding heads. All right, yeah, uh, thanks you, thank you all for having me. Um, you have indeed all, uh, some of you have known me for a very long time since I was a grad student at Stanford um, doing my PhD on maps and monsters in medieval England. Um, since then, I've written a couple of books on monsters and a whole lot of articles on maps, and now I'm doing another um, book on maps before I probably write another one on monsters. Um, <laughs> and uh, what I am uh, going to talk with you about today is uh, mapping the worlds of the global Middle Ages. Uh, just a bit of context for that. In the last couple of years, the global Middle Ages has become a big buzzword. And this results, um, I think, from a very good impulse, which is that People who specialize, as I do, in medieval Europe have realized that um, that focus, while wonderful in and of itself, is a kind of myopia, that it involves uh, focusing on Europe to the exclusion of the whole rest of the world. And this matters um, especially as far as our teaching goes, because we have students who take our courses and they, let's say, sign up for a course on medieval art. Well. My institution only offers one class on medieval art and I'm the one who teaches it. And so if we do nothing but medieval Europe, which is almost always by default medieval Christian Europe, we've actually limited the scope of what our students become familiar with, how much of the world they come to know, how much of the uh, bounty and variety um, of the medieval world uh, existed, which also directly pertains to the bounty and wonder of the diverse modern world we all live in. Um, and so people decided to start focusing on what they call the global middle ages, which is an acknowledgement that the world has always been interconnected to varying degrees. Uh, of course, the middle ages were less connected than today. Um, and the portions of the world that were in close contact were more limited, of course, than they are now, but the world was more connected up than we tend to assume. Um, and so uh, because of our specialties, because of the way we're trained, we're all trained to know, you know certain languages, certain uh, religious histories, certain political histories, economic histories. Very few of us are really in a position to study and teach a whole world. Um, and so uh, at least for me, this um, immediately uh, leads me toward the, my favorite kind of work to do, which is collaborative work. I am always happiest when I'm writing with somebody uh, who is um, smarter than me and energetic and engaged in the work and comes with a different skill set than I do. So that might mean working, you know, I'm an art historian, it might mean working with a lit specialist um, 
who really, really knows the languages that we're looking at uh, uh, and is interested in the images, but uh, is not a specialist in them. Um, but it might also come in the form of working, say, with an Islamicist um, who is interested in cartography. So I could come to the project with an interest in medieval Christian cartography, and this person could come with an interest in medieval Islamic cartography. And uh, that's how this project um, that I'm going to talk out of um, started, um, with a desire to stretch beyond the boundaries of what is, was to me familiar territory. And so I teamed up with two other scholars, uh, Dr. Karen Pinto, uh, who is a specialist uh, in medieval Islamic map making, and then Dr. Cordell Yi, who is a specialist in medieval Chinese map making. Um, and the three of us, uh, we plan to ultimately write a book out of this if that all happens. Um, but as a start, we wrote um, an article jointly and we uh, gave some talks and that kind of thing. Um, and so what I'm gonna talk about today comes from our collaborative work. And so it will be divided into a couple of sections. First, a kind of general introduction, then I'm gonna look at um, medieval European maps, then medieval Chinese maps, then medieval Islamic maps. Um, and to be clear, in the Q&A portion, I will do best on the European stuff. No bones about that, that's my area. Um, and I'm relying very heavily on the work of my two colleagues for the other sections, but um, I'm learning more about them and I'm very interested uh, in the ways that looking at maps from one region or culture transform the way we understand the maps from others. Um, just as looking at medieval maps has given me a lot of perspective on modern maps, so too looking at medieval maps from other cultures gives me more perspective on the medieval maps I study. Uh, so uh, with that preamble in place, uh, I'm gonna get rolling. If I click the right button, I will. Okay, so understanding worldviews. Maps are amalgams of words and images of history, myth, and religion, of art, and science, and as such, they highlight the arbitrary divisions we've created between modern disciplines that have little or no relevance to the study of medieval artifacts. Maps, therefore, can be of great use across many disciplines. Even the most ordinary seeming maps, like the one I have on screen now, embed myriad ideological arguments and assumptions. As you know, I study medieval European world maps, particularly those from England, and have been working for the past few years on a collaborative project with scholars who come from the history of cartography from other geographic special specialties. Um, stuff I just explained in the preamble there about who they are and that I'll be relying on their works here. Um, so uh, the three of us have been using these old maps in our teaching for many years and have found that maps provoke some of the richest class discussions every semester. And I'll address some of the ways this can work. Maps are gripping, consuming things. They draw us in, they orient us in space and time, invite us to explore their intents and create whole worlds for us anew. My collaborators and I are working to place particular stress on the value of studying and teaching cartographic materials in the context of this effort to engage with the global Middle Ages. For this important project, maps are obvious, appropriate, and highly effective pedagogic tools. If we wish to understand what a global Middle Ages might mean, one place we could start is with our subject's understanding of what the globe looked like. Many of the myriad cultures that coexisted throughout the world in the era loosely gathered under the Eurocentric rubric of the Middle Ages had their own mapping traditions and conventions, some in dialogue with one another and others wholly separate. This evening, I'll focus only on the three cultures I mentioned, Christian Europe, China, and Islam. But I hope that uh, my colleagues and I can eventually explore the power of medieval maps in greater detail and with more geohistorical and cultural breadth. So, Reorientation. In the spring of 2019, Karen Pinto and I tested the possibilities of teaching across traditional boundaries through maps. I always included a unit of medieval cartography in my medieval art courses, but it only ever covered European Christian maps. And really, if I'm being honest, I'd only ever covered English and French maps. Last year, I invited Karen Pinto to Skype into my course after a week in which students examined Christian mapping with a focus on TO maps. Those are the ones on the right side of the screen there, and I'll talk about them in a bit. She brought to class a series of Islamic maps that served several purposes. First and foremost, they're important and interesting in their own right. Second, they expanded the scope of my unit 
and therefore the course as a whole. And third and most potent, they inspired a reorientation of the course in a way that lasted throughout the rest of the semester. In the most literal sense, medieval Islamic maps are, in general, oriented differently than Christian maps. Whereas Christian maps are usually oriented toward the east, toward the orient, Islamic maps are usually oriented to the south. This is the most obvious, but far from the only difference. In confronting medieval Christian maps, students must first adjust themselves to the Eastern orientation. Many tilt their heads to the left while looking at the screen, and they squint a bit before seeming to become comfortable, as if they have found again the world that they knew. When we presented them with medieval Islamic maps, the students again tilted and squinted and eventually settled into the new conventions. However, what they achieved in each case was a false sense of comfort. Medieval maps do not present the world we know today, not because the world has changed so much, though it has, but because maps do not show the world as it is. Dennis Woods, my favorite cartographic theorist, says, there's nothing natural about a map. It is a cultural artifact, accumulation of choices made among choices, every one of which reveals a value, not the world, but a slice of a piece of the world, not nature, but a slant on it, not innocent, but loaded with intentions and purposes, not in a word as it is. What we see then when we look at maps, including the most current maps produced with the latest satellite and GIS technology is not the world, but the worldview of the map's creators. Each time we can disorient students, we can reveal a new, the ideological underpinnings of our own maps, and in doing so, reveal some of the ideological underpinnings of our current historical and political moment as well. Uh, so a very brief social history of cartography. I'm gonna sum up 50 years of research in two minutes now. For much of the 20th century, and in fact, the 19th and 18th, Historians of cartography were concerned with movement toward greater mimesis, that is imitation of the real world, with demonstrating progress toward greater accuracy, and therefore saw early maps as crude and later maps as superior. The critical cartography movement shifted the focus of the discipline by suggesting that scholars should evaluate each period and each map on its own merits, based on the goals of its creators. J.B. Harley was the generative figure in this movement, uh, and the multi-volume landmark, The History of Cartography series that he edited with David Wood, which began in 1987 and is still ongoing with new editors, um, remains the field standard. Harley drew from a wide range of theories coming to maps, not just the history of cartography. He drew from information theory, linguistics, semiotics, structuralism, phenomenology, development theory, hermeneutics, iconology, Marxism, and ideology. Uh, Harley was actively fighting what he called the positives, positivist school of cartographic thought, which maintains that cartography can be and usually is objective, detached, neutral in all disputes except between truth and falsehood and transparent and can be exact and accurate. These terms, objective, detached, neutral, exact, accurate, these are ideas that we're used to thinking are valuable in maps but in fact are not present in maps. Harley instead advocated for what he called a social history of cartography, a non-positivist alternative that entails not looking through the map at the world it depicts, but inward or backward to its maker and outward or forward to its readers. Before proceeding, we should try to define the key term in play here. What is a map? Harley and Woodward adopted a new definition of maps uh, for their uh, pioneering work, one that's not too restrictive, but also not quite so general as to be meaningless. They said, maps are geographic representations that facilitate a spatial understanding of things, concepts, conditions, processes, or events in the human world. Responding to this, another map scholar named David Turnbull offers two important uh, refinements. He says, firstly, maps are selective. They do not and cannot display all there is to know about any given piece of the environment. If they did, they'd be completely uh, jumbled and meaningless. They would look like the world itself. The point of maps is to not look like the world, but to help us understand it. 
how people think about that world. Um, so they do not and cannot display all there is to know about a given piece of the environment. And second, if they are to be maps at all, they must directly represent at least some aspects of the landscape. And by landscape, uh, he doesn't mean, you know, like the, the trees and hills, he means the features of the natural world more broadly. The process of analyzing a map is very closely aligned with the process of close visual analysis that I and my students use all the time in art history. Maps rely on all of the same formal compositional elements as any other visual material. In looking at any map, uh, we can consider any of the following. The material, size, support, scale, orientation, centering, borders, colors, languages, scripts, symbols, visual hierarchy, and the vital choices underlying inclusion and exclusion. Turnbull reminds us that the mapmaker determines what is and equally important what is not included. Whether the mapmaker deliberately considers each of these choices. Should rivers appear? And if so, what colors should they be painted? Should they be labeled? And if so, in what language? And in what script? Or whether the mapmaker is merely reproducing uh, what seems to be standard conventions unthinkingly. These remain choices with important consequences for the map and for the territories it describes. As Turnbull argues, the map if it is to have any authority, must have the appearance of artlessness. That is, it must appear simply to exhibit the landscape rather than describe it with artifice or in accordance with the perceived interests of the mapmaker. Propaganda is more effective when it's not clearly positioned as such, and all the more so when it hides under the guise of something like scientific neutrality, less operative in the Middle Ages than after, perhaps, or religious authority, omnipresent in Christian maps of the period. As Turnbull continues, the power of maps lies not merely in their accuracy or their correspondence with reality. It lies in their having incorporated a set of conventions that make this combinable in one central place, enabling the accumulation of both power and knowledge at its center. Karen Pinto has developed a useful exercise for her history of cartography courses. She asks her students to make a map, any map they choose. She gives them 30 minutes. They place their maps on a common table and each pick another's map to discuss without knowing whose it is. Each student attempts to figure out the intention of the cartographer. After presenting their reading, the student who made that map reveals themselves and discusses the deductions of their peer. This exercise is crucial for an introductory course in the history of cartography because most students come with the typical modern map of the world, the United States of America in the middle, emblazoned in their minds. On the first day of these courses, she often uses another exercise to help students understand Islamic world maps that would be helpful in grappling with the many forms of pre-modern mapping. Since Islamic maps, like most Christian maps and some medieval Chinese maps, do not point in the usual northerly direction of most modern maps, Pinto asks students to turn all maps they consult to face any direction but north. She recommends they pin up paper maps on their walls oriented in different directions in order to learn to see the world in anything but a northerly direction. This is a key entry-level exercise for being able to understand uh, medieval maps from around the globe. Exercises like these help students break out of their worldviews and learn the basics of map analysis, which they can build on through the course. It makes them more open and receptive to medieval maps that initially look very strange to their eyes. It takes work to coax modern people into understanding and appreciating all the amazing things that pre-modern maps have to tell us. So to the first main section, medieval Christian cartography. Most discussions of medieval cartography are studies of medieval Christian cartography, though they are rarely framed as such. The preponderance of the maps that appear in all the standard texts on the subject were produced by Christians for Christians from explicitly Christian perspectives and defined by Christian ideologies. I used to take this for granted, but now I try to be direct in addressing this both in class and writing as it is essential for understanding the ideologies at play within these maps. By far, the most common map type from medieval Christian culture is the TO map. This surprises most modern people who come across them who struggle to recognize these even as maps, or at least as maps with any utility. They are therefore uniquely well-suited, though, to classroom teaching. 
they are deceptive in their apparent simplicity and clarity. On screen, even on the small screens you're probably all looking at, every detail of the map on the right is visible. Yes? A TO map uh, th that appears, as many do, in a copy of Isidore of Seville's popular etymologies will serve as my paradigmatic example. Uh, you all may have come across Isidore at some point in all the work that you've done. He was one of the most influential writers um, from the uh, early, early medieval period, late, late, early Christian period. Um, he was a, a, a bishop in Seville, uh, and he wrote a sort of encyclopedia called the Etymologies, which uses often fantastic, made up, um, origins, etymologies of Latin words to understand the divine plan that God has for everybody on earth. Um, and uh, so because of that, he has just entries on everything. So if you are a medievalist and you want to know, like, what did people in the Middle Ages think about rubies or poplar trees or fish, whatever, he's got that in that book. And you can look it up and see what he says. It's incredibly useful. Uh, and he has a whole section um, about the world and the way it's organized. And these maps often attend just that section. Um, when I use this map in class, I often spend the majority of a three hour class session just on this map. This is an exercise that initially strikes students as completely implausible. And yet semester after semester, three hours prove inadequate to unpack all that is happening within this small circle. This serves not only to demonstrate the power of mapping, but also of uh, what one scholar, uh, uh, Jennifer Roberts, calls deceleration and immersive attention to objects. Uh, you are all familiar with the way that our digital world fractures our sense of attention, gives us a sense of uh, urgency as we, uh, the primary um, term used to describe what we do online is not study, or as medieval people would have it, ruminate. It's browse. Yes, we use the web browser to pour through large quantities of material rather than giving them slow time and care. And so uh, Roberts gives us a sort of rallying call to get our students to slow down and really look at things. A map like this, perfect for that exercise. Very difficult at first, completely rewarding in the end. Um, so this TO map is a relatively bare bones version of the type, which is why I like using it. Uh, though there are yet simpler versions that are nothing but a circle inscribed with that T that divides it. I begin by asking classes, what choices did the map maker make in designing this map? The, Is the Isidorian version reproduced here is standard in all major features. It's oriented to the east, the location of Jerusalem and they believe the Garden of Eden, and of all major biblical events. Uh, it is composed of three outer rings defining the universe and then the great world ocean that encircles the three parts of the earth, each labeled in red in a majuscule display script, Asia above filling half the ecumene, the inhabitable world, uh, Europe to the lower left and Africa to the lower right. Each Latin toponym or place name is preceded by two puncti, a medieval form of punctuation, and is followed by three more, suggesting that these individual words are intended as complete grammatical units, as somehow complete thoughts. The parts are divided by rectilinear bands schematically representing waterways. The vertical uh, Mediterranean divides, uh, let me get a laser here, here we go. Oh, yes, uh, laser pointer, there we go. Um, so the vertical Mediterranean here divides Europe from Africa. Um, and then the Nile, divides Africa from Asia. It was a point of much contention actually in the Middle Ages where Asia and Africa are divided. It is not nearly as straightforward as you might think. I promise, go look at a map where actually does the division belong. It's completely arbitrary. And they put it halfway through Egypt, which is a little strange. And many medieval commentators said it doesn't make, make any sense. It can't be between those things. Um, and then even more arbitrary, where does Europe end and Asia begin or the other way around? Um, there is no clear answer to that, but the answer they came to in the Middle Ages was a thing called the River Don, which is a river that nobody much thinks about today, except for the people who live right around it. Uh, they called it the Tanaeus River. Um, so that's what they used to divide Asia from Europe. So that's what this represents. 
The linearity of these waterways, the T of the TO, transform the waters into the cross of Christ, reaching from one end of the ecumenae, the inhabitable world, to the other, generating an image of a globe encompassed by Christ and therefore established for the exclusive use of Christians. The apparent simplicity of the map makes it seem increate, like it was always there, given natural. It is in no way thus. Every line, every dot, the ink colors, the language choice, the script, every element re represents, as Wood reminds us, choices made among choices. As an experiment to reveal these choices anew, last year I commissioned a student artist to produce a series of variations on this TO map, tweaking properties in a range of ways, and I just let her loose on it. And these are the uh, wonderful results of her work. Um, this series stands in for the many variations that I've drawn on whiteboards during class discussions over many years. The variations are all deliberately close to the original. All are circular, though it's possible to make world maps in any shape. And medieval examples survive that are rectangular, oval, almond-shaped, diamond-shaped, multi-lobed, and on. I'll show you some more of those later. Um, and all show and label the three parts of the world. They maintain the language and script and punctuation, and yet, each presents a different world, a different world view. Each of the choices made among choices resulting in meanings. What is privileged through orientation? Superior literally is the Latin word that means above. Inferior is the Latin word that means below. Or hieratic scale, since scale here is not based on some factual accounting of landmass area. What is equated? How close or distant are these lands? How vast and uncrossable or narrow and easily forded do the waterways appear to be? All of these choices make a difference. The TO map is based on a few lines of text in Isidore's etymologies. These are a couple of passages that are likely uh, the, the sources for it. Um, the text is imprecise, and what details there are are not actually necessarily conveyed by the map. What does Isidore mean when he writes the central sea is called the Mediterranean because it flows through, quote, the middle of the land, media terrare, Mediterranean, all the way to the east, separating Europe, Africa, and Asia? The answer presented in the TO map is a possible reading of this, but it's not the only plausible one. Some of our modern variations on the TO map form appear actually also in uh, surviving medieval cartography. There are west-facing maps, south-facing maps, maps that give less ground to Asia, so-called YO maps that divide the ecumena evenly. Uh, the most apparently subversive of our modern variants is that which denies the ecumena pride of place in the center of a divine creation. And yet there are medieval maps hybrids of east-facing TO map types and north south, or south-facing zonal maps that present five climate zones from frigid poles through temperate regions to a scorching equatorial zone, which decenter uh, the inhabitable world in a very similar fashion. Those of you who remember my talk with the Blemies, the headless people many years ago, this is the same manuscript. Um, so presenting these variant models or inviting uh, modern students, listeners, readers, to read these texts and draw their own maps draws attention to the deliberate nature of these most popular of medieval Christian map types. Okay, now, story of the stone, the middle kingdom in the middle, medieval Chinese cartography. Two of the most famous Chinese maps from the Middle Ages are carved on opposite sides of the same stone slab. One is the map of the Tracks of Yu, a legendary emperor. Uh, it's from uh, 1136. What attracts interest of modern uh, cartographic historians is generally the square scaling grid superimposed upon this map of China. Each grid increment represents 100 Chinese miles. Geographic space thus seems to have been mathematicized. In large part because of this map, Chinese map making during the global Middle Ages has often been regarded as moving toward modern cartography. Thus it might at first seem that China presents an exception to the characterization of the history of medieval map making presented 
in the beginning of this essay, of this talk. The map on the other side of this stone um, is in, uh, alters that potential counter narrative somewhat. This map bears the title Map of China and Barbarian Lands. Unlike its companion, this map does not have the scaling grid, and it represents way more topographic features, but in some ways is much more generalized than the companion map. The line representing the coastline, for example, is not nearly as nuanced. Also, this one does not bear an expressed scale, that is to say something that says an inch equals a mile or something like that. These two maps are often classed as Chinese world maps. But world here should be understood in a somewhat restricted sense. In the context of the global Middle Ages, the notion of a Chinese world map should be separated from that of a globe. For Chinese map makers, the Earth was not a sphere. They generally treated the Earth as flat, or perhaps with a curve so slight that representing the Earth's surface on a flat sheet would not result in much distortion. They did not have a clear conception of the Earth's dimensions either. The boundaries of these two maps may not have corresponded to notions about the limits of the Earth. Nevertheless, the territory shown in these two maps represents much less of the Earth's surface than appears even in the earlier Western geographic works. That is, the type of medieval map that modern po uh, positivist cartographers see as better, these, is the one that is more limited in scope and rooted in a notion of a flat Earth. This is not to say that the European ones seeking to show an entire round globe are better. They're not. My point is that these maps all have their own properties and are based in their map makers' assumptions and ideologies and should be taken on their own grounds rather than in some sort of competition for which maps are most like ours. The two Chinese maps on either side of this block of stone are oriented in opposite directions, suggesting that it was not meant for display. Instead, since they're engraved into the surface, they probably served as the originals of copies made by ink rubbing. That the stone uh, engravings were used to produce copies serves as a reminder that for at least part of the global Middle Ages, printing was already in use. Beyond its lack of expressed scale, these two maps differ in that uh, the map of China and barbarian lands is heavily annotated. You can even see a bunch of uh, text on this map in the detail I'm showing you. On Chinese maps before the 20th century, the image was generally not the primary bearer of quantitative information, such as direction and distance. More often, such information was contained in accompanying text. Focus on maps like the Tracks of You, however, has contributed to a general disregard for non-mathematized maps from China. Taking the non-mathematical seriously would detract from a narrative that has modern cartography as its end. That, popula that popularity of that narrative belies the much greater number of non-mathematical maps among the extant body of works. Such maps lack a scaling grid or express scale and their directional orientation may be inconsistent. Instead of abstraction, their mode of representation tends toward the pictorial. For example, here is the map of the Shu River. Uh, which dates to uh, perhaps the early 13th century, and it's drawn on ink on six sheets of paper, mouth form, a hand scroll. You'll see a thin gray bar at the top of your screen. That represents the entire map rolled out. Um, it depicts the courses of two waterways in Sichuan. From right to left, the first three sheets show the north-south stretch of the Min River. The second three sheets show the Yangtze River from east to west. Between the two, there's a gap representing about 200 kilometers. Along the waterways are the names of 189 places, mountains, caves, administrative seats, and temples. The map has no particular scale, so one cannot read distances from the image. Since text was the primary carrier of such information, some distances between places are noted on the map. Despite the lack of scale, the rough equivalent uh, equality between lengths of the waterways and between the length of their representation suggests the map maker paid some attention to actual physical geography. The order of the places named lines up with geographic fact and some of the inscriptions cite geographic works. Some inscriptions note changes in toponyms in accordance with practices of historical geography. Directional orientation is not consistent though across the length of the map. 
the straightness of the scroll suppresses changes of directions in the waterway. And we should bear in mind that one runs north-south and the other east-west, though on the map they both run right to left. Unlike the two previous Chinese maps, or the European maps, or the Islamic maps I'll get to shortly, this map is not meant to be seen as a whole in a single look. In order to see it in its entirety, one would have to unroll it and then step back to the point where the work would appear to be a long band, but in which you would be unable to discern much of any of the detail, uh, which has been executed in the manner of Chinese landscape painting. Landforms and architectural elements are represented in a pictorial manner. To view the map as intended, one would scroll through the map section by section as if one were moving alongside the water and viewing the scenery. Looking at the map would thus be a way of simulating a journey along these waterways. The Qilong Emperor, uh, who was ruling in the late 18th century, was moved to inscribe on this work. The space, uh, in the space between a span and 10 feet, there are 10,000 miles of scenery. One completely casts off the marks of brush and ink and roams with the maker of things. The emperor also inscribed the poetic sequence Autumn Meditations by Du Fu, which is from the eighth century. Uh, he had once lived near the Min River in Chengdu. And among the verses he cites are these two lines that describe a river scene and evoke the dynamism that is lost in a still picture. In the river, waves join the frothing sky. Above the passes, wind and clouds touch the shadows on the ground. The toponyms not only serve to identify places, but are themselves a display of artistic skill. An inscription by the prominent artist Don Chi Chung uh, from the uh, 17th century praises the calligraphy fine as a fly's head and the small characters written as if they were large. The inscriptions serve in part to record readers interacting with and contributing to the work. They show that the work was appreciated as the site of the three arts, painting, poetry, and calligraphy, known as the three perfections. As such, the work also achieves a temporal unity, going beyond the Middle Ages and spanning 10 centuries, poetry from the 8th century, painting from the 13th, script from the 18th. When one tries to take in the map whole in a single look, one loses sight of its perfections and its unities. The whole is in some ways less than the sum of its parts. The extant maps from the 12th through the 19th century do not suggest a mathematical tradition, but movement away from the mathematical, an emphasis on the mathematization of space, on horizontal linear distances, leads to a falsification of the historical data. The result is an impression of homogeneity, even a lack of features of interest. Faced with the non-mathematical, those seeking to mathematize Chinese map making deny that works like the map of the Shu River are maps. They argue that maps have practical uses and paintings have artistic intent. The toponyms and notes on distances work like they do um, in this map, however. The notes on distances on works like this map indicate that they were intended at least in part to serve as geographic references. Otherwise, there'd be no need to provide such information. In addition, it's not clear why artistic intent disqualifies a work from maphood. And it is clear that maps from all the cultures represented in my talk were products of artistic intents. It is not difficult to conceive of practical purposes for an attempt to convey the appearance of a place or a region. From Chinese map making, one can begin to see that global Middle Ages is not simply an incipient global modernity. Maps like the map of the Shu River, made centuries after the invention of printing, suggest the resilience of practices of manuscript culture. If there was a print revolution in China, it proceeded more slowly than the one that marked the end of the Middle Ages in Europe. In addition, rather than looking forward to modern cartography, much of Chinese map making looks back to Ptolemy's geography. Their geography, the making of maps of large areas is distinguished from chorography, a type of map making focused on smaller areas and requiring the skills of a painter. The maps with which my treatment of China began are often read as leaning outward toward the edges and beyond as if in anticipation of expanded foreign contexts and further imperial ex expansion. The prominence of rivers on the two maps, however, directs one inward to riverscapes such as those shown 
on the map of the River Shu. These are worlds worth exploring as well. One quick moment as I reach behind me. Opening a window for a bit of fresh air in this small room I'm in. So my final section will be on medieval Islamic cartography. Thousands of maps survive from the medieval Islamic world, especially after about 1200. Developed initially sometime in the 9th or 10th century, maps showing the shape and organization of the world, especially that of Islamic regions, were of considerable interest to medieval Muslims. These maps are generally anti-naturalistic, abstract, deliberately schematic. They do not provide the easy access of naturalism, but instead are composed of deliberately stylized images made up of a series of curious geometric shapes that look like birds, eyes, fingers, anything but the kind of mimesis that we are accustomed to on maps. Their abstraction, though, did not diminish their value. Such maps continued to be copied in manuscripts in the Islamic world into the 19th century. Instead of attempting to produce an image of the world as it is to convey the shape of landforms and waterways as they actually are, these stylized images function as mnemonic and contemplative devices that help the viewer understand the world, which involves more than just its outward form. This world map is from a late 12th century copy of the Book of Roots and Realms made in late Arab, uh, Arabo-Norman Sicily, and it was possibly browsed by the Emperor Frederick II in his youth. Within the encircling ocean, uh, most of the blue there is lost, but just inside the red band, you can see particularly at the top of the page, the uh, lovely blue waves. Um, within the encircling ocean, the world is geometrical, with compass-drawn circles of red, blue, and gold. To see how this can even be a map, we'll look at a slightly simpler example, another map um, of the same variety, but from the late, uh, a late 15th century copy, commissioned uh, for a library complex established by Mehmet II following his conquest of Constantinople in 1453. I pair it here with a simplified diagram of it. First, a bit of search for the mimesis that is actually present to make these works more accessible than a bit on the meanings. So here's a map that shows the world as we are accustomed to it. Now, I can turn this map so that south is on top instead of north, as is in the modern Western practice that has serious ideological implications. Flipping it over, Africa looms large at the top of the image, as it does on medieval Muslim maps. Because the maps under consideration predate contact with the Americas, we need to cut the Americas off. And we'll also remove the northernmost regions of Europe and Asia. In order to align the medieval Islamic tape map with the increasingly altered modern maps, we then also need to skew the projection, and you'll pardon my uh, crude attempt at this, but uh, if we enlarge and stretch Africa so that it merges over toward Australia, uh, in keeping with the concept of an overextended Africa that dominated medieval and Islam Islamic and Christian geographic thought, at this point, it becomes much easier to see how the schematic medieval image is in fact based on our familiar globe. The contours are a bit different, but the overall arrangement is not strikingly dissimilar. It's possible to connect various choices reflected in the orientation, arrangement, and scale of the geographic features with cultural values and experiences. The southern orientation of most maps produced by medieval Muslims, for example, is likely the result of these maps having been designed in the Abbasid Caliphate's major centers, which were to the north of Mecca and Medina. A south-facing orientation would privilege, therefore, the holiest cities of Islam, much as medieval Christian maps privileged Jerusalem and Eden through their eastern orientation. In contrast, the exaggeration of Africa might result not from religious concepts, but from a navigational experience. Muslim sailors frequented the coasts of East Africa and did not circle the horn, resulting in a foreshortening of the continent. Records suggest that Muslim ships, like most medieval ships, didn't stray from the coast, and therefore, though they did visit Sofala uh, in present-day Mozambique and Madagascar, they did not sail to India by crossing the Indian Ocean, but by following coastlines around the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, this could account for the diminishment of the distance from Africa to India. Therefore, while medieval Islamic maps give the initial impression to a modern eye as being entirely divorced from the natural world, there are strong elements of mimesis present. 
On most Islamic maps, like the Christian Teo map described above, the world is surrounded by an encircling ocean, in turn surrounded by the names of eight cardinal and intermediate directions. The Indian Ocean and Persian Gulf become dominant, curling into the center of the Ecumene, whereas the Mediterranean, dominant on medieval Christian maps, is small and peripheral. The extended mass of Africa forms the large pointed arc at the top of the map, as in the altered world map that I showed you, and the land mass to the lower left is therefore Asia. And the mass that connects them is the Arabian Peninsula. This means that the small, rather unobtrusive triangle of land in the lower right is Europe, far less central to medieval Islamic religion, politics, culture, travel, and trade. The scale of Africa and Asia on these maps therefore reflects their relative cultural importance to the map makers. This is one of the most significant elements that we as people living in the West can take away from these maps since we're so used to Eurocentric conventions that we generally fail to even see them for what they are and take them as neutral or natural design choices. A few other bodies of water are significant, the keyhole-shaped Caspian and Aral Seas, the rectangular Nile, other rivers such as the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Indus, and so on, um, are all smaller and less significant. The wastelands of the poles are not noted, and the boundaries between territories are often drawn in, uh, and toponyms and ethnonyms, that's the names of peoples, abound. This brings us back to the elaborately illuminated late 12th century map uh, that I started with. Looking at the somewhat more schematic maps, um, schematic and mimetic allows us to understand the basic features that make up the classical medieval Islamic world map, and the worldview it reflects to see the familiar and the strange, but also to allow the unfamiliar to remain distinct. So finally, a closing that hopefully is also an opening. What is a map? Or perhaps better, what are maps? At the start, I discussed attempts to broaden definitions of a map. It may be that maps cannot be reduced to single all-encompassing definitions, but instead have what Wittgenstein calls family resemblances. They may have no one thing in common, but are related to one another in many different ways, to the point that similarities crop up and disappear across examples. There are also a range of forms, conventions, and purposes to consider. The examples I've shown tonight differ in governing principles, spatial organization, format, medium, and technique. And these differences imply differences in how users understood the world and their relation to it. This is just one reason why maps like these are crucial to the project of globalizing the Middle Ages. Okay, there we go. I will stop there. Um, and we'll take, a, should we take just a couple of minute break for everybody to go have a sip of water, myself included. Um, and then I'd be happy to take questions in just a couple of minutes. Great. Okay. I'm going to turn off my camera for a minute here. You might stop your screen share, Asa, if that suits you. Hi, Julia. It's Karen. It's Karen. I I've tuned in late. <laughs> nice to see you. I'm not actually seeing you, but nice to hear your voice. I know. Uh, I have to get uh, a, a computer that has more space for the Zoom application because <clears throat> it does it, it. Well, sometimes it supports my camera and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> well, welcome. Yeah, this was fascinating. I'm sorry I missed the start of it, but... Uh, mm. Boy, I just, you know, this is all new. Um, what was behind the design of those maps is fascinating. Yeah. Do you have a whole crowd of people there? I mean, I see you have 37 participants. 37 but, people, yep. Yeah. But see, I don't hear anybody else. So are they all muted and gone? Or? We're, all, we're all muted. And I'm going to mute you too in, in due course when uh, Asa comes back. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But I couldn't resist this opportunity to talk to you. 
I'm so thrilled that uh, Sarah is active, and uh, my goodness, this, the number of people. Yeah. Is this strictly Sarah, or was there a larger audience invited? The whole the whole Sarah list, uh, but more people can come because people live a distance away and they can't get to Menlo Park on a Monday night. Oh, I never thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that shows my brain's getting pickled. <laughs> And Aces yeah. and Chico, we might not have seen him at all this season. Aha, uh -huh. I see another face there. If, if Karen, if you put it on gallery view, which you may find in the top right corner of your screen, you can see all of us who are showing our faces. Oh my word, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for that. I've always wondered what that little box was for. Hey, Virginia. Yep. I just uh, turned the video on for me. I had myself blacked out so mm -hmm. I could concentrate on the lecture. Well, it didn't do me any good to click gallery view, but I may, well, I of course have to do it, I guess, when everybody gets back. Swipe your hand across it too. Swipe, swipe left or right or left and you'll get the next batch because there are more than nine here. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not getting anything but uh, just your face, but it says. That's full screen. You probably have speaker that's view. Yeah, well, that's, it's, yeah, that's what I have is speaker view. Well, next to it, uh, maybe you can find an icon that'll say gallery view. And then you can see all of this. But a lot of people are not showing themselves right now. <laughs> I wouldn't mind. You guys all sort of look the same, but I've got hair a foot long and it's... Uh... <laughs> so does Linda. Not Linda Jack, but L Linda Papa Niccolo. I've never seen her with such long hair. Mm. <laughs> well, it's not very flattering, but uh, I thought I'd just let it grow for a while. And uh... Mine's longer than it used to be. But yeah, I it left it. it has I've, got a, I've got my 13-year-old cutting mine these days. <laughs> oh, <laughs> It's not a great deal to cut, so it's not, um, you know, I, I felt thoroughly comfortable giving her a shot at this, and she's been doing an exemplary job. Well, it looks great. It looks very professional. Yes. Well, thank you. Uh, she's not in training but to be a hairdresser, is she? Uh, she is not. Uh, <laughs> no, we try. You never know. Nope. Nope, nope. She's been keeping, uh, she's been keeping me trim, keeping us very well fed as well. She's a, an excellent pastry cook, so. Uh, wow. Fantastic. That's true. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You raise them well, Asa. Let me tell you, the creme, the creme brulee she made yesterday, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> I never thought I'd buy my uh, child a blowtorch, but it was definitely the right move. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm back and ready, as you can see. So if you don't want to um, go for questions, just let me know. And... Um, I, 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 I open the floor and shall do my best to equip myself as well as I can. Asa. I'll keep an eye out for raised hands. Jody. Great. Asa, I just wanted to thank you for that um, delightful lecture and a completely different perspective I've never seen on maps before. It's, I've never, uh, that was extremely um, exciting to see and I just have never seen that before. The with the OT, the OT map. It, it, it makes me think differently on everything. Thank you. Fantastic. I mean, I I wish that everybody spent more time looking at maps and thinking about them. I always think that what we do in the humanities, right, is we we find all of these abstruse objects and texts, and we try and read out of them people's views of the world, right? So like, I don't know, we take some fragment of a poem and say, how do we understand their worldview from it? In fact, they actually drew diagrams of their worldviews. Those are what maps are. So if you want to understand people's views of the world, you just look at their worldviews. It's great. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, I fell into working on maps accidentally. It wasn't like I studied, like I went to school to be a history of cartography person. Um, I found them kind of by accident and have fallen thoroughly for them and I adore those weird TO maps. They're so useful. Would, would you say that contemporary maps reflect our worldview? Absolutely. I would say that maps 
have to reflect worldviews um, because you must make choices, right? You can't just show the world because that would make no sense to anybody and also would be, for a start, the size of the world. Um, so you have to first make it a whole lot smaller. And then once you've done that, you have to make all of these decisions. And those decisions, whether you are conscious about them or not, will reflect how you view the world. Uh, there's a cartographic theorist, a guy named Mark Monmonier, and he wrote this great book called How to Lie with Maps. Mm -hmm. um, and his opening position is, the thing about maps is they all lie. They have to, that's how maps function. It's not incidental. And by lie, he really means, you know, show things that are not the truth, not accurate, but um, representations. And so what he, what he says is map makers are going to lie. So they should be really deliberate about what lies they're choosing to tell. Um, and I would say that's true of all our modern maps. I mean, I began, I just had that map of, uh, you know, a bit of the Mississippi. Have any of you ever been to the Mississippi? Yeah. What color is it? Mud. Yeah, right? The Mississippi <laughs> is brown. And on every map you've ever seen, it's bright blue. Um, <laughs> this tells, I mean, this is a convention to show that it's water, but it also tells us something about how we wish the water was, right? They all are embedded with our ideologies. Absolutely. Always, 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 always. Kathleen has a question or a comment? And so I wondered if any of these, uh, uh, the maps that you showed of, from Africa, from Asia, and from the Islamic world, had images on them like the ones you found on the medieval European maps with the little monsters and so forth. Uh, regrettably, I they don't. Um, now, uh, China has a very rich tradition of monsters. Um, and in fact, uh, they have a set that is identical to the ones that I often study in a European context. Um, that set probably, we know, we can trace it back in Europe um, from, the, from the Middle Ages to the Romans, to the Greeks and a Herodotus, the guy who wrote the history is the father of history, that Herodotus. Um, he says that he got those accounts from two people, uh, one of whom went to India and one of whom went to Persia, a guy's named Stesius and Megasthenes. And um, so in theory, if that's true, those creatures probably originally come from India and they probably went west uh, with the Roman Empire and trade routes and they probably went east uh, with Buddhism. Um, and so the same exact creatures show up in Jap Jap uh, Japanese and Chinese and Korean sources and so on. Uh, first China, then Japan, then Korea, following the spread of Buddhism. Um, and so they have those, but they don't put them on the maps. Their maps are much more... Um, rooted in the familiar landscape. Uh, and that's probably partly because their maps really are of China. Um, they're not showing. So it, the European maps have Europe over in a corner and then has this whole world that they haven't, that they're imagining, that they're envisioning, that they're uh, thinking is wonderful and horrible and all these things. Um, so it's very different than the, the maps, for example, that Europeans made of Europe that don't tend to show these things because it's their own territory. Uh, as far as the Islamic ones, um, I think it's probably largely a result of the generally aniconic nature of Islam. I mean, far too much has been made of that, you know, this notion that like Islam never allows any images or whatever. Modern fundamentalist versions of Islam don't, definitely. And there are various movements and so on throughout the history of Islam that are more and less strict about this. But there's also an incredible image making tradition in Islam. But there is a kind of aversion to representations of living things, mostly that means people and animals and then also deities. Um, and so I think the lack of those images or the not presence of them, I shouldn't call it a lack, that implies they should be there, but the non-presence of them on Islamic maps probably is largely uh, due to um, the generally aniconic nature of uh, Islamic um, culture, I think. William has a question and then Roy. Very much. Um, in 25 words or more, would you trace from the images in the 12th century to, let's say, more mundane Portolan maps that navigators use? That's a dynamic tree. You know, that's a change. It's, it's, it's a utilitarian uh, and sometimes very artful uh, form of representing the world, but totally different. 
Yeah, no question. The Bertolan charts are very different in their a lot of their external features, and they do have a potentially more practical function. But a lot of the Bertolan charts were never taken, you know, navigationally. Right. Um, so uh, there's um, uh, one prominent example uh, that was gigantic. It was like 12 feet wide or something, and it was mounted on thick wooden boards, and it likely hung in a royal palace. Um, so it might have helped that king understand the world, but didn't help him actually like travel from one place to another. That's the same thing, though, that these other maps are doing, is they're helping people understand the world. And I guess the question is sort of what's the first and foremost, the primary reference point? Uh, and if that primary reference point is uh, Christian mythos, then the, um, the earlier maps, the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th century maps, that's really what they're doing. They're establishing an understanding of the world as a Christian entity, as a Christian, as a thing produced by the Christian God. Um, uh, uh, Jerome, uh, St. Jerome says, the earth is our great book. And what he means is like, you could read the Bible, that's the great book, and that will tell you God's plan. But you could also look at the earth and derive God's plan out of that as well. They, that it's like an equivalent thing to the Bible. And so that's what uh, the earlier medieval European maps are doing. Then the Portolan charts, yeah, they do come out. They're looking back to some ancient traditions, some Ptolemaic stuff that gets into you know, navigational maps. But then if you want, once you sort of wrap your head around how different they look, what you'll find is they still represent a lot of those same principles. So for example, I actually just read a, an article, I think last week, on the presence of Prester John on um, one of those sets of maps. Uh, and he shows up on some of them. But uh, Prester John is the mythical, I, mean, I saw some of you nodding along, um, the mythical Nestorian Christian king who lives in Africa, or maybe Asia, it depends on the source, um, who the Crusaders were hoping was going to come and defeat um, uh, Islamic forces um, and rescue them. And he was rumored to have, you know, this astonishing army of hundreds of thousands of people and untold wealth and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if we're thinking, well, this is a navigational device, well, what the heck is Prester John doing on there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Mansa Musa is on there as well on one of them, uh, who is the only... It's the only instance I, th I think um, known of a known African ruler represented mm -hmm. on one of these maps. Um, so they're doing some interesting things that go well beyond um, navigation. Uh, so they are very different, uh, but you know, uh, historians all fall into two categories, lumpers and splitters. <laughs> Right, splitters are always talking about like major divides. This was a signal moment, and everything was different after. And then lumpers are saying, "Well, actually, everything is always the same, and things keep going." Right? I'm more of a lumper than a splitter. Um, so both at, both perspectives are, of course, true. Right? There are great changes, and within those changes, great continuities. And, and the Portolan maps, many very artful, as you point out. Um, have uh, generally, at least in the Christian world, point northward. Mm -hmm. You have up, up and down. And they have enormous evidence about the directions of wind, mm -hmm. right? And not insignificant accuracies on coastlines, particularly in the Mediterranean mm -hmm. and in the Baltics and the North, North Sea. Um, so somewhere there... Uh, map makers began to decide a convention, right, which was at least north, right, magnetic north, true north, who cares, but a convention may be generated around the, let's say, 12th century, 13th century discovery of magnetic north, and the ability to use the power of nature, wind, tide, etc., to propel trade. Mm -hmm. And that is an enormous influence in the economic development of particularly Europe in the European maps. Yeah, I would agree absolutely with all that, except one caveat I would put in, which is that the way that Portolan maps are often reproduced and often displayed in modern collections yes. does give a slightly false sense about their orientation. 
which is to say they look good pointed toward north, but a lot of them have the text oriented, um, there's a term for this, boustrophetically. <laughs> what is that? I learned that from a German linguist who happened to be standing next to me in the British Museum one day when I was looking at the Frank's casket. Uh, it means the writing follows around on an edge. Boustro is um, from the Greek for a bull, and so it's as the bull plows the field. Uh -huh. um, and so what it means is that the, the writing goes around in a circle in essence. So the writing faces the edge. And what that means is if you are standing in front of one of these things hung there and you're looking at the lower section, it's oriented toward you. Mm. But if it were flat on a table as they were, and you walked around the table to the north, it would still be oriented toward you. Um, and so to a certain degree, at least some of those maps don't really have an orientation per se, mm. right? because if they're meant to be viewed horizontally and for you to go around them or to spin them toward you, uh, like you know our um, modern maps, which all live in our phones and have only an orientation that's us, uh, those Portolan ch charts also probably work that way, which makes sense if you're going to navigate by them, right? You yeah. will face different directions. Like if you're in a church looking at a map on a wall, the orientation is forever fixed. It points toward the east, end of story. But if you're a sailor, and you happen to be sailing west, you might want to face your map that way. And to me, the Portolan maps represent the emergence of a secular society as power. Um, in fact, one of the most interesting of these maps is long considered to have been made by a guy named Abraham Kresge, who was a Majorcan Jew, um, who was paid to make maps for Christian kings. Um, and that does point toward a more um, secularist orientation, right? They would not have had Jewish map makers making maps for Hereford Cathedral, right? right. Um, but for a royal purpose that was aligned more with what? Trade and military conquest and alliances and all that. This guy knew more. He had better knowledge. He was a better map maker. They hired him. Um, yeah, so there is a shift in that direction, I would agree. Thank you. So just one tiny, not a shift away from ideological map making, just a shift in which ideologies are primary. Jody, you're on. Have to unmute. Hi, uh, hi, Asa. I I, I um, was wondering if you saw in the Islamic maps in the in the Muslim regions, it would, to me, it would seem very important to them orientation um, towards Mecca. Was there, in, in the ancient maps, was that orientation noted um, in the ancient maps that you've seen? Yeah, that uh, so I do, they, yes, they do, well, the majority of them face to the south. Um, the theory is that they do so because, in fact, the majority of them were made north of Mecca. So if they're made north of Mecca, Mecca is to the south, consequently oriented to the south to point it in that direction. Uh, there are, just like there are European maps that face to the north and this east and everywhere, so too there are Islamic maps that point in point different directions, but the preponderance of them point south. Um, and so, yeah, that is likely an orientation toward Mecca. Although uh, Karen Pinto has argued recently um, that our idea, like we call them Islamic maps. We call, we call Christian maps European maps and we call maps from the Islamic world Islamic maps. And that both of these are kind of misnomers because a lot of the medieval European ones are in fact explicitly religious. And a lot of the uh, Islamic ones come from secular context, secular manuscripts, secular royal purposes and so on. So they're not, um, they weren't say hung on mosque walls the way that uh, some of the Christian maps like the one in Hereford Cathedral or the one in uh, the, the closer uh, Ebsdorf in Germany were. Um, they were predominantly housed in uh, royal libraries, places like that um, in the Islamic world. So, uh, so, Islam clearly is a, is a presence there, but it is not sort of the, the sole focus of them in a way. Roy, you're, you're up. Uh, I've got two short questions. Uh, 
in the context of trade and communications, I remember some years ago seeing a scholar who had, uh, through maps, traced the communications between Rome and a variety of uh, monasteries, many of which were located on very, very remote sites, but near water, an ocean or whatever. And the context of his uh, modern map was showing the uh, routes that ships would take to get communications between Rome and the, uh, and the monasteries for Ireland, for example, uh, in the Norse countries. And the other question I have is in terms of Roman maps and trade maps. Now, long before Marco Polo, there was overland trade routes between the West and, if you will, China. And the Romans had trade across the desert to the Red Sea and then the Red Sea around to India. So in any way, did that influence the, uh, if you will, the Arabic map making? of the time that what the Roman experiences and theoretically they must have had maps of some kind, but that's a several hundred years before the Islamic uh, takeover. Yeah, curiously, uh, almost no maps at all survive from the Roman Empire. Um, and those that do are a little more like, uh, we call, I don't know, like a city plan. Um, so you can see, you know, the Romans had these grid, you know, regularized grid cities everywhere they went, they would like plop down, use the same model. So there's, you know, like standard. Uh, so we've got a couple of Roman city maps like that, um, but we don't have any maps from Rome um, that show sort of this vast networks. There is one map, a thing called the Poitinger table, um, which Emily Albu, who is at UC Davis, I think, um, lovely, wonderful person, um, has written a bunch about, and some people think that it is a later copy of a Carolingian copy of a Roman map. Mm -hmm. um, and if so, it shows a big swath of um, the Roman world and trade routes and so on. But it's an, it's an anomaly. It's a strange map, and there aren't any others that survive like it. And it certainly is not itself Roman. It's much later. Um, so we don't really know much about what Roman maps were like if they, in fact, had them. It's very clear that travelers did not first and foremost rely upon maps. Um, and go, well, how the heck could you get, you know, from Scotland to China <laughs> without a map, right? And there's a couple of answers to that, which is first off, very few people went the whole way. These long trade networks were series, it was like a, like a relay race. It was series of shorter journeys, predominantly. Um, so you'd be traveling more in a range that you, you were fairly familiar with too. And this is gonna sound kind of ridiculous, but there weren't that many roads. There really weren't. Any of you ever driven across South Dakota? I've driven the whole way. There's basically one road that runs all the way across South Dakota. You don't need a map to get from one end of it to the other. It's not like driving through the Bronx. Um, the fewer roads there are, the less maps actually become that important. You get on the road that goes to the place, and then you arrive at a crossroads, which will be where there's a town, and you say, hey, which one of these goes to Bordeaux? And they point you toward Bordeaux, and you go to Bordeaux. Or you get a local guide who takes you the next leg, and the next leg, and the next leg. Um, so maps don't seem to have been really that important for travel in the pre-modern world. Uh, that shifts with the age of um, more global sailing, right? That's when they start using maps for navigational purposes more, not for land travel, sea travel. Using maps for land travel seems to happen a whole lot later than that, actually. Um, but to the question about how this would have influenced uh, Islamic maps and or uh, Christian maps, definitely, because those travelers, those trade networks led to lots of written accounts. And those written accounts are very important in the writing of, um, or the construction of these maps. Uh, one of the things that shows up, do I happen to have one of the maps that has it? Um, there, uh, if you read in uh, uh, medieval sources, the um, short, ah, there it is. Um, hold on, let me do a quick screen share again. Okay. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Okay, oh, come back. Um, you all know about the chain across the Bosphorus? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
right? That's it. Yeah. It's right here. Where? Where? Uh, yeah, let me uh, put on. Right here. You all see that red dot moving? No. No. Uh, uh, okay, hold on. I'll do something else. Wait, wait. Ah, I just saw the red dot appear. <laughs> Uh, oh, well, no, I got a plan. Now it's a, now it's a cursor. Yep, I got a plan. Hold you, hold on for one second. We'll get there. <laughs> uh, Boom! Yay! Yeah. Yay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. See it. your chain. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's this um, famous <laughs> chain across the Bosphorus used to control trade um, and um, uh, <laughs> taxation and so on. Um, and so that's appearing here as like the signal feature of how Europe, that's that little triangle over there, is connected to the vast Islamic world. That's literally everything else on this map. So the world is divided here into the Islamic world, which is this giant elegant thing, and the little corner, the little triangle in the corner, that's Europe, which is literally chained to it. So, you know, these little details like this are part of the um, literary and textual tradition of travelers' uh, counts that um, would have pieced together a lot of the scope of the world. And I, I, you know, I mentioned before that the European maps uh, have content that comes from Stesius and Megasthenes through to Herodotus, through to Pliny, who gives them to Isidore and so on. So a lot of these portions of the world are, ideas about portions of the world are based on that actual travel, um, but not necessarily on maps that would have been used during that travel because those maps don't really seem to exist. Andrew, and then followed by Bob Scott. Uh, just a question, it's probably an optical illusion, but, or I missed something. On the picture of the Chinese river, the Shu Tuan Tu, was there a circular geometric shape in the middle of it? Uh, there is one, yes. Oh, and I saw, sorry, I saw your, uh, in the chat when we were on our little break, I noticed it, but then I forgot to get back to it. Um, there is a little, <clears throat> circular thing there um and your question inspired me to go and take a closer look and I, I do definitely see what you're talking about uh this thing right here yeah yeah it's like an oil drum cut at a very slim circle so it looks like a large circular vat yeah i concur and i do not know what it is i'm not going to pretend to but i can ask cordell Yi if he can tell me what that thing is okay so if you'd like to know I will try and find out for you. Yeah, it's just interesting because it seems so out of context with the style of everything else about the picture. Yeah, it's clearly a man-made thing. It's not a um, natural feature of the landscape, but it, um, so not knowing what it is, I'm, not, I'm, I'm now going to speculate on why it's there and what it means. How's that? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm, you, you'll certainly get past, you'll certainly pass my uh, assessment of it. Anything. All right. So, um, as I was trying to describe this map, uh, this object that we can think of as a map, it is, as Cordell tells us, pictorial. And what he means is it looks like the actual place, right? It reflects the actual scope uh, and shape of the landscape there. And so it is a reasonable presumption that, if not every tree, the large uh, sections of mountain, the large outcrops, the river, bends, and so on, are rooted in the actual landscape there. And so what that thing is, which is probably explained by uh, the inscription right above it, um, is likely to be something that is, you know, actual, known, knowable uh, to the people at the time. So uh, it reflects a different Chinese approach to map making. If we look at the European ones, we can see all kinds of, um, uh, uh, you know, there are all these different cities presented and so on. They do not, generally speaking, have any mimesis. Uh, they may all look exactly the same on a given map. Every single one is the same golden triangle. Or they may be a kind of random uh, conglomeration of, you know, towers and points and so on. Some of them, that's not universally true. Um, there are uh, some that do show knowledge of individual cities. Matthew Paris's maps of... Uh, Europe shows some particular knowledge. He's clearly, he lives near London. He knows what London looks like. His image of London looks somewhat like London, for example. Um, so there's a variation in how much they do and do not 
the Islamic maps make no attempt to represent, you know, anything familiar in particular, right? They show um, the sort of overarching organization of the landscape, not its individual features. And so what you're seeing in whatever that interesting man-made drum structure is, what you're seeing is probably an actual recognizable piece of that landscape that somebody who had traveled there would know, would recognize. Uh, it's probably memorialized in the inscription on the map. Um, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Bob Scott? Uh, Asa, your analysis uh, uh, is not only very intriguing in understanding the periods of history that you, fr from which the examples you've given are drawn, but they're very contemporary as well. And for what it's worth, I wanna offer just two examples to add to your arsenal of examples. Please. Uh, when I, uh, 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 during the years that I was on the faculty at Princeton, I gave a seminar that was offered in the basement of the Woodrow Wilson School, which is the Woodrow Wilson School for International Studies. And uh, so I went into this seminar room and the walls were covered with a map. And I looked at it and it was bizarre because on that map, the Soviet Union completely dominated the entirety of the map with little land masses marked Europe and the United States and other parts of the world. And so I thought, how did that get there? And what is that about? And I began doing some inquiry and found somebody in the library of the Woodrow Wilson School who said, oh, that's the famous Red Scare map that was drawn by the Pentagon during the Cold War. And what it was designed to communicate is the overwhelming dominance of the Soviet Union in land mass and every other way uh, uh, depicted in this map. And she said it was a copy of the map that was routinely distributed around the Pentagon at that time. So that's one example. Yep, the absolutely. Other... Uh, just just yeah. a quick follow up on that. Yeah. Uh, the maps that were most popular when I was in school during the sort of late Cold War Reagan era uh, were based on the Mercator world maps. They show the Soviet Union uh, compared to the US 225% larger than it actually exactly. is. Exactly, exactly. That, uh, that's exactly it. The other thing is uh, I remember reading a book about the map that's drawn of the famous London underground map. Mm. And the thing that's interesting about that is that the book detailed examples of all of the efforts that were made by other map makers to come up with a map that could be used by riders of the underground uh, to navigate it. And the mistake that they made is they tried to draw it too accurately. Mm -hmm. And the map that you see on, you know, the, the one we all know is actually a grotesque distortion of what's underground. It's just that it's a very useful way to be able to navigate around the city. Yeah, I would only, I would only change one thing there. I'd say it's a glorious distortion, super oh, useful. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. um, and the New York City subway map um, yeah. is terrible uh, mm -hmm. because it actually follows the size and shape of New York. There are newer redrawn ones that are actually fundamentally based on the London ones that are vast yeah. improvement. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. much easier for confused tourists wandering around my beloved city. Um, it would help so much uh, if they would ditch the old map. And the, the, the newer versions of it are, are somewhat improved. Yeah, yeah. You don't, if you're on a subway, why do you care the exact distance between two stops? Because you get off when the train stops, right? So you don't have to know the actual distance between exactly them. Exactly right. Oh. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, wow. I agree. Hey, um, Andrew, uh, I happened, I, I, I had a little idea uh, and I decided to give it a shot. Uh, just in the background, while I was talking to you and then at the very beginning of Bob's question, um, I pulled up uh, the incredible Google Translate app on here and I pointed it 
at medieval. that bit of uh, medieval Chinese calligraphy, uh-huh. and it said Oat City. I bet you that's a grain silo. Oat City, yeah. yeah. I bet it's a grain silo. So, uh-huh. which would have been a very important um, thing in the landscape. Now, of course, the phone could definitely be wrong, and you know, we should not. I will not now publish that. Uh, <laughs> But I just thought it would be fun to give it a shot, and I was surprised that it actually yielded a result. It's too good an answer to be wrong. Yeah, right? Yeah. All right, so sorry. Brief, brief jump back. Kathleen and then Roy. Yeah, I, while you've been talking about these various other kinds of maps, one occurred to me, or a type of map occurred to me that I was reading about recently, and I wondered if you know anything about the Polynesian maps because I found it fascinating. They, would, they are absolutely nothing like ours, but they tell you exactly how to get around the Pacific Ocean. Are these the, they, uh, the carved wooden ones? I'm not sure. Some of them I think were, some of them are oral. Oh, okay. Uh, some of them are, uh, have been written down though by people who were transcribing. Oh, the, interesting. Yeah, no, I'm not. Is, there's a book that I found this in called The Sea People. That's a wonderful book on its own. Mm. But it, this would be very pertinent to what you're talking about. And it's something you could probably sneak in and surprise all your colleagues with because they <laughs> probably don't know about them. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, there are all kinds of cartographies. Um, and the kind of positivist um, cartographic history that I was talking about at the beginning has led a lot of people to not perceive maps where they exist. Um, so, you know, I said that there aren't um, maps from Rome really, but of course there are incredibly rich and detailed textual maps that give extremely uh, uh, interesting accounts of the landscape, the um, geography, the orientation, the arrangement, the ever right? Um, and so if we accept uh, verbal maps as maps, and why wouldn't we, um, then uh, yeah, there of course are Roman maps as well. And so yeah, there are uh, all kinds of uh, different mapping types and we just have to stop looking for things that look like the thing Mercator drew. Well, these maps that the Polynesian used were sometimes written down, but, uh, but the Westerners who came there didn't recognize what they were. Mm-hmm. And even when they were told they were maps, they couldn't believe it because they didn't follow any kind of uh, structure of the maps they were familiar with. And it was only later when, they, when people began to ask the Polynesians what they were and how they were used and what they meant that, aha, oh, well, yeah, okay, that explains how you could get across the Pacific when Westerners couldn't. <clears throat> Yeah, and clearly their navigational skills were unparalleled um, prior yeah. to, you know, modern navigation. Um, you know, they did not actually find Easter Island in Hawaii by accident. No. <laughs> well, it's a wonderful book on the way that the, the, all of the Pacific was populated from the earliest times that, until recently. So I, I recommend PC people. Got it. And Roy, and then Dick. Roy, you have a question? On you, unmute. Okay. Am I unmuted? Yeah, yes. there you're good. Okay. Uh, years ago, I had an interest in the legends of the 14th century uh, Chinese voyages of exploration. And that was rekindled a few years ago because it was a legend because nobody could believe that they could build ships as large as many of the, of the narratives said. And a few years ago in a dredging operation, I believe it was, they actually found a giant rudder buried in the mud, which showed that the Chinese could have in the 14th century built such ships. Now my point is, and I just looked it up, it talked about, uh, the particular Chinese admiral and said his fleet followed long established well mapped routes of trade between China and the Arabian Peninsula Mm -hmm. that had been used at least since the Han Dynasty. So what is that 14 about 1200 thereabouts. And if those were well mapped, per se, 
do they still exist, the kind of maps for those well-mapped routes that have been described? Yeah, interesting. Um, I, not that I know of. I don't think so. Though, again, going back to what we were just talking about, well-mapped might mean, I mean, I'd wonder about how that, what, what, what does the text actually say, right? Because <laughs> um, map is actually not a word that exists uh, in most pre-modern contexts. Uh, even the Europeans, that doesn't exist. The word map doesn't exist in the Middle Ages at all. Uh, these things we call mappa. Mappa means cloth or sheet. Uh, so mappa mundi is the yes. sheet of the world, is the thing that people put the world on, right? It's not yeah. a separate kind of thing. Uh, it only later comes to mean that um, uh, uh, car, you know, in carto, as in cartography, that, you know, these are later terms. Um, so what were they describing? Was it a textual account that showed, you know, stop here, stop here, stop here? Was it a visual thing? Was it a pictorial kind of image that would have given a sense of the landscape like um, the, uh, the map of the rivers that I showed? Um, but to my knowledge, there is not a surviving thing that we would immediately recognize as a map of those trade routes that survives now. So it could have been an, uh, an oral thing. Yeah. You're here, go to the way you said, point that way. Yeah, it could mean well-known in essence. Yeah. Um, but we should always bear in mind, a ton of stuff is lost. A ton of things are lost. Um, from the earlier Middle Ages, uh, it's been pretty credibly argued, in England anyway, that we've lost something like 85 to 95 percent of the manuscripts, um, which is, you know, horrifying. But um, a guy named Dario Gamboni wrote this great book on the destruction of art. And in it, he says, it is the natural fate of artifacts to disappear. Uh, and I read that, I don't know, 15 years ago. It really stuck with me because... Um, you know, we tend to lament the losses. You know, there's that meme that goes around that says, you know, if you're, you're, you know that you're a geek if you're still upset about the burning of the Library of Alexandria. And I am still upset about the burning of the Library of Alexandria and I am a geek, okay. But we should actually revel in the weirdness that anything survived, right? History is a meat grinder. Um, and that we have any maps to look at from the Middle Ages from any portions of the world is extraordinary. Uh, and so, I don't know, I mean, I do lament the losses, but I try and focus on how wonderful it is that something survived. Yeah. Thank Jake you. Jones? Uh, I'm sure that you've seen the map of uh, the United States according to somebody in, from New York, in which oh, Manhattan, yes. Manhattan famous New occupies Yorker, at least a third of the area. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I was also wondering about uh, the TO map being centered on Jerusalem. Is that uh, right, or am I just remembering that incorrectly? Uh, no, that is correct. Um, many medieval maps are centered on Jerusalem. Many, though, that has frankly been overplayed. Um, there are a lot that are not. Um, here, I'll show you. Uh, this is um, the uh, Psalter map. Uh, which is a particularly beautiful example. And you can see right there in the middle, yeah? It says Jerusalem around this central dot here. Mm -hmm. uh, and right in the very center of that, that's literally where the mapmaker's compass point was to draw the circle. Um, so there are lots of medieval maps that are in fact centered on Jerusalem. Um, this is the Hereford map, the big famous one, and right in the center of it, right. again, that's Jerusalem. Uh, and so that is a common feature, though there are uh, other ones that don't do that. Um, if you're going to put Jerusalem in the center of a TO map, you run into an odd problem. Um, so this is a kind of modified TO map or a fancified, more detailed version of a TO map. Um, and you can see right across the central band, those two rivers, it says Jerusalem, right? Yeah. And it's got right in the center a cross that presumably marks Jerusalem. But that means that Jerusalem is actually in the water, right? Like they've made a la Atlantis out of Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem should be here, right? It should be at the end of um, the, the Mediterranean, not somehow inside the water. Uh, and if you look over toward um, what is the, uh, the south on here, you can read Terra Iuda, the land of the Jews. So... 
And uh, Mount, Sy Mount Zion is this lumpy thing here, these red things there, and then Palestine. Right. So it's not really clear how they're trying. They, they, they want Jerusalem to be in the middle of that map, but the middle of that map is a bunch of water. And so they've kind of made a cluster of things around the center of that water to try and sort of bring these two things into alignment. Now, in the simplified TO maps like this, the simple versions, there is no, you know, they don't say Jerusalem, but there is that dot, right? You can see the dot in the center of that land map, uh, of those waters where the map maker's compass point was. And I would presume that that actually would have recalled for uh, its contemplative audience, Jerusalem. Thank you. Any more questions? I'm scanning the group here, looking for waving um, hands. I have one. Have something fun if, um, if you want to. Um, just, Asa, I've been recently been learning power, um, a mapping technology to try and do maps. Mm. So I was thinking of showing you one just for fun. Sure. Um, but I don't know whether I'm in charge of the screen, actually. I think Julia is, aren't you? Can I share my screen? Uh, I haven't done enough of this to know the Let answer to that. Let me just try. Yeah, all participants. It is set. Yeah. Did that work? Yeah. Here it comes. Oh, yes. Um, so this is odd to show you, but this is a small area of England called South Derbyshire. And in 1895, this was the Repton and Gresley 100, the area in green with the strange separated circle. And one of my pastimes is to look through the 18, AD 1334 lay subsidy roll. And I mapped which places existed in 1334 mm. and they're in black. And then the ones that didn't exist are in red and nothing else exists. It's just kind of a rural area. So there, are, there aren't many villages there. And so you can see that the shape of the, the area that was not populated has a clear pattern to it through the middle of it. And through that, um, you're able to see that it was actually the hundred of Repton separated from the hundred of Gresley. Mm, sure. That late settlement area in the middle didn't exist. But what it, what I found really amazing about your presentation, it was great, is the power to start drawing maps is dangerous because you can start to create conclusions and make things look just right when you're not really sure actually about some of it. But it, once you put it down in a map, it feels a lot more certain than it was <laughs> when you did it. Absolutely. Suddenly it seems factual. <laughs> it seems like it's simply been discovered, not created. Exactly. Yeah, that's great. Anyway, I just thought I'd share it because you 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 um you prompted me to go deeper into mapping. It was a very good presentation. Thank you. Well, fantastic. Well, um, seems uh, I mean, it's right at eight forty-five, and uh, I'm sure you all are tired, as I know I am. Uh, okay. So it might be a good time for me to thank you all very much for your attention, your great questions. Thank you. Uh, thank know you the very much. Always comes uh, well enthusiastic, so I always uh, right. agree to come back. So it's been a pleasure seeing you all again. Uh, after a while. Um, and, uh, Great thanks. to see you, Asa. Thank you so much. Great. Okay, I'm gonna log off so you all can continue to chat at your leisure. Um, but uh, have a great evening, thanks a lot. All thanks right, thank you. Come bye. back soon. Bye-bye, okay, we'll do. I think I'm gonna go have dinner. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Everyone is. Anybody want to stay on board? We can leave it open if you like. I'm good with this now too. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Good thanks, night. Drew. Thanks, thanks for coming. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, see you, everybody. Uh, happy uh, Happy holidays. Yeah. yeah. Time for Padre Moreno. Remember. <laughs> see you then. Bye bye. Bye.